This area of the western plains of the river Indus lies within the most westerly region of India, the state of Gujarat. Vast salt pans alternate with savannas of grass, thorny scrub and solitary trees. Here we will find some of the most characteristic animals of India. Protected by the religious beliefs of the local peoples, blackbuck antelopes, wild asses and nilgais have here found their last refuge in the fight against extinction. And so this area, almost 5,000 square kilometers in size, the heart of which is a salt desert, has paradoxically become a paradise for wildlife, the sanctuary of Little Ran of Kutch. A new day begins. At the edge of the desert, the lower saline levels of the soil make it possible for grasses and bushes to grow. These provide food for the Nilgai, the largest antelope in India. The plants also contain water and every morning are covered in dew so the Nilgais can go for some time without having to drink. Like the Nigai, the blackbuck antelope feeds during the first hours after dawn. In the harsh conditions of Ran, this is the only time of the day when the temperature is pleasant. As the morning goes on, the cool of the night disappears, and by midday the heat has become unbearable. The herbivores then rest and ruminate, becoming active again only when night falls and the temperature again goes down. Antelopes gather in groups of between 15 and 50 individuals, led by a dominant male. Their defense strategy against predators is flight, and the open spaces of Ran are ideal for this, as there are no obstacles in their way. From June to September, the humid monsoon winds from the southwest bring heavy rains to the desert, flooding the grasslands. But now the land is dry. Fewer and fewer of the rivers and lakes still contain water, and the scorching desert winds make it impossible to breathe. The antelopes know the desert well, know where to find one of the few remaining pools containing water. The black buck have adapted to the arid conditions in Ran and can go for two or three days without drinking. Then they need to go looking for water. They are not the only ones. The Nilgais also need to go to the pool every few days to replenish their water reserves. The females and the young go in groups of between four and ten, while the males go alone. The black buck antelope can quite happily remain standing while it drinks, but the Nilgai sometimes needs to kneel because it has a very short neck. This is a disadvantage compared to other herbivores because it means they are slower to escape when danger threatens. A new family has joined a large group of visitors. Wild boars have also found an ideal habitat here in Little Ran, despite the extreme conditions. 
Before they drink, nothing better than a roll in the soil to clean themselves and get rid of parasites. Meanwhile, the antelopes leave them a space at the edge of the pool. The pool is a permanent meeting place which all the animals of the area must visit sooner or later. The constant presence of herbivores makes it the ideal hunting ground for predators and the antelopes must always be on their guard. A group of jackals comes to drink. Though they are not a real danger, the nervous antelopes run away. When it comes to survival, it's better to be safe than sorry. The geographic location of Little Ran means that these arid lands are of strategic importance for many species of birds in Asia. Year after year in winter, thousands of cranes come to the waters here to escape from the cold and snow of northern Asia. The impressive Himalayas are no obstacle to these cranes. When they are migrating, they can fly at altitudes of over 8,000 meters. The drongos, like the cranes, are drawn here by the warm climate and the cool nights. The heavy monsoon rains mean that for a while water is not a problem and there is no shortage of food. Both the local wildlife and the visitors will have little problem surviving the winter here. Before the drought returns to the desert, the migratory birds will have returned to where they came from. A jackal hidden by the grass searches for food, little knowing that he is being spied on. The nervous female antelopes are alerted by a suspicious noise. Oblivious to the commotion he is causing, the jackal pounces on a locust. The most experienced female jumps to warn of the possible danger and immediately she is copied by the others and the whole group flees, not knowing why but simply following the lookout. In order to mark their territory, the male blackbuck defecate around its edges. Defending their territory and their harem is a never-ending year-round task. Marks must be constantly renewed. Otherwise, other males who have reached sexual maturity and believing their territory to be unoccupied will try to take it as their own. The size of the territory will depend on the strength and vigor of the antelope that defends it, as well as the density of population which limits the availability of land. In addition to the feces, the males also mark the scrub and the high grass with a strong smelling secretion. This they produce in special glands near their eyes which they rub against the branches they want to mark. The female antelopes are ready to mate between February and March. This ensures that the young will be born at the end of the rainy season when pasture is most abundant. Aroused by the smell of the females, the dominant male stretches his legs and tosses his head back. He's not the only one. The smell is carried by the breeze and the young males invade the territory from which they were expelled when they reached sexual maturity.
The dominant male will have to watch over his harem, court the females and expel the invaders, all of which is exhausting work. Each antelope will attempt to conquer and mate with the greatest possible number of females. This competition prevents the genes of the weakest males being passed down to future generations. In this way, natural selection ensures the strongest breed, and so the survival of the species is guaranteed. The excitement seems to be contagious, and a male lapwing moves close to the female with the same intention as the antelopes. These small birds build their nests on the ground, and for the first month the chicks are unable to fly. With hundreds of antelopes running around the plain, this is extremely dangerous. Fights between the males are very common at this time of year. The young males, having attained sexual maturity, desperately try to establish a harem and challenge the dominant males in the hope of stealing females from them. The clashing of antlers is spectacular, but injuries are rare. The shape of the antlers means that real damage is rarely inflicted. As the dry season continues, the water level in the lakes goes down. Many of them dry up completely, and the aquatic birds are forced to move to the few lakes which still contain water. More birds arrive every day and will do so until the migration season is over. There are two species of flamingo here, the greater flamingo and the lesser flamingo. The greater flamingo plunges his head right down into the water, gathering his food from the mud at the bottom of the lake. The lesser flamingo filters the water nearer the surface. It moves constantly through the water, fanning from side to side as it goes. In this way, the two species are rarely in direct competition for food. This ecosystem is increasingly hostile and herons and other wading birds also fight for survival in the lake. Beside them, a young Indian ibis or painted stork is learning how to fish by touch using the sensitive part of its beak to detect the presence of fish without having to see them. If any bird can be said to be perfectly adapted to these harsh conditions, then it is the ibis. It can cope with drought and heat and lives in little ran all year round. In order to regulate its body temperature, it defecates on its own feet and so takes advantage of the cooling effect of evaporation. The longer days and the rising temperatures are a sure sign that winter is coming to an end. The flamingos fly off back to where they came from, where the snows have now disappeared and conditions are without a doubt better than those that will soon prevail here in Little Ran. The heat has evaporated the water and once more there is drought and desolation. The dried up lake is now dead until the next season. 
Looking at it now, you would hardly think that just a few months ago, this lake was bustling with life. All that remains are a few hardy reeds whose deep roots reach right down to the water beneath the soil. And so, with a little luck, they will manage to survive until the next monsoon arrives. Nonetheless, this arid region is also home to the Gauracara, the wild Indian ass. This powerful animal has adapted perfectly to the harsh conditions of the Ran Desert. It lives its life mainly on the edges of the desert and around the grassy oasis within the desert itself. But when it senses danger, it can happily live and survive for several days in even the most arid regions. The mating season is from August to October and males and females pair up and move away from the group. After pregnancy of 11 months, a single foal is born. The herds then separate according to sex until the young reach the age of three months. Of the three most characteristic species of the Little Ran Sanctuary, the ass is, without a doubt, the best adapted to the conditions of the desert. Its body can store enormous quantities of water and its cells are resistant to dehydration. This means they can stay alive even with the absolute minimum of water. When they drink again, their cells replace the liquid that was lost and revert to the original state. In the middle of October, the sanctuary of Little Ran receives new visitors, the Rabari Indians. This semi-nomadic tribe has about 250,000 members. At this time of year, the Rabaris form groups of between 5 and 15 families, load up their belonging as a move to the territories in the south in search of pasture for their cattle. Both the Rabari and the Vaishanava, another ethnic group in the area, respect the local wildlife and this has been fundamental in the survival of the asses, antelopes and nilgais of the region. Apart from their cattle, the principal source of income for these people is cotton. They use this material to make their own clothes. The enormous farms need a large workforce during harvest time and the landowners employ the Rabari, both men and women, to do this hard work. The movement of cattle is an increasingly complicated matter. In the past, the farmers would allow them to cross over their land and the cattle would fertilize the soil. But now landowners are less welcoming and at times even hostile. The traditional routes are no longer viable and the new ones are dangerous. The Dibari have had to adapt to these adverse conditions and they now combine cattle rearing with work in the fields. The work is exhausting and often goes on until nightfall. When darkness falls, the life of the Rabari is transformed. With a good fire, food, music and high spirits, the quiet night becomes a celebration. And so they put behind them the rigors of the day. Men and 
women dance around the fire. The Dabari women are respected and treated as equals. They do not cover their faces and go unaccompanied around the villages and towns. They are in charge of the camels that carry their belongings on the annual migrations. They like to dress smartly in brightly colored dresses, a great deal of jewelry and tattoos on their bodies. They also consume a considerable amount of snuff. The Rabari have also unwittingly played a part in the reduction in the number of wild asses. The transmission of diseases from domesticated animals is one of the main causes of mortality, along with the degradation of the natural habitat due to the commercialization of the salt from the desert. Watching them gallop, we get an idea of just how well adapted these animals are. Their ability to resist dehydration means that even in the burning sun, they can run for 20 minutes at speeds of up to 70 kilometers an hour. Even foals of just a few months can run for 30 minutes at 40 kilometers an hour. The black buck antelopes are even better runners and can reach speeds of up to 96 kilometers an hour. The rabari present no threat, but unfortunately this is the exception to the rule. Once considered Krishna's favorite antelope, they are now killed to make table legs and decorative lamps. In contrast to the Vishnoi, who believe them to be sacred and sacrosanct, for the majority of people they are simply a source of income for their precarious economy. In the past, there were as many as 4 million blackbuck antelopes, but the numbers have now fallen to less than 25,000, and their future seems uncertain. The desert, a symbol of death and desolation, has paradoxically become a refuge for the Nilgai, the blackbuck antelope and the wild ass. Precisely because this land is of little value to men, it is the only safe place left. India is a country of contrasts, myths and legends. Since time immemorial, she has fed the imagination of dreamers and enchanted all those who know her. And once more she has surprised us. These lands of little value to men are a treasure of nature, and drought and scorching heat have here in Little Ran become a synonym of life. <laughs> 